afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our latest Wine Communicators of Australia webinar. Uh, my name is Angie Bradbury. I have the great pleasure of hosting our conversation this afternoon. Um, glad to see such a fantastic crowd already on with us. Um, just a reminder, in, for those of you who haven't done one of the webinars before, it is an interactive session. Um, we do encourage you to post questions and commentary. You will notice in the box on the left hand side of your webinar screen, um, there's some rolling um, questions and comments there now. You can post a comment in a comment box and we will get to it as we go through the conversation. You can also post questions to Twitter using the hash WCA web hashtag that's currently up on your screen or if you would prefer send an email to Jen Barwick um, via that email address and we will do our absolute best to get to those questions um, as we go through the session. Don't worry though if uh, we don't get to covering off all the questions today, we will um, put extra comments and responses into our WCA blog um, which you'll be able to access through the member newsletters as we go. So today's topic, um, getting media attention in the right way. Um, we're going to be covering off you know, some of these things around the media landscape, what journos want, what they never ever ever want, uh, and some aspects around deadlines and how to make sure that um, in this really complex and ever fragmenting media landscape you can actually get your brand message heard. Um, I will not be doing most of the talking this afternoon, um, but uh, our fabulous panel will be, um, and that is uh, Nick Ryan. G'day, Nick. Hello, Ange. Um, I, I really don't think either Nick or Jane need a, an enormous amount of introduction from, from us today, but um, suffice to say that Nick Ryan and Jane Faulkner, hello, Jane. Hello, Angie. Uh, are two of our absolute top wine writers and wine commentators in Australia and have both very generously provided their time today to share their views with us and their commentary about making sure we get the right messages to the right people around the right time and try not to drive these wonderful people too crazy um, with some of the stuff and some of the bad habits um, that we've got into along the way. So. Uh, Guys, why don't we just kick off with sort of uh, sharing, you know, some high level insights or ideas about um, what's good and what's maybe not so great. Jane, do you want to kick off? Sure, I'd love to. Um, look, thanks everyone for joining in and um, I will reiterate to really send the questions because you've got an hour with Nick and myself where we can be, I mean, we're honest and frank people anyway, but really to we're happy to answer those questions and do so immediately, which is a much better way of getting around it. I want to also add that this is not a bagging session for PR people uh, or marketing people, nor I guess journalists, but um, what I'll be saying, I'm going to be candid about some things and I want to kick off with um, to say that the number one thing for me in terms of dealing with anyone is, um, you know, you call us wine writers, journalists, whatever you want, but the primary role I guess for me is I write for an audience. I don't actually write for PR people, I don't write for marketing people, that's not my job. So if I'm after a story, uh, sometimes I do get them in a press release, often not, and we'll talk about um, that in a bit more detail later, but I'm after information most of the time, it's not a hard ask. Um, my inbox every day is, uh, well, between 50, maybe 100 emails, roughly the same thing, you all want the same thing and I understand that but there's only me and, <laughs> me in my office, so bear with me when I do perhaps take a bit more time to get back to people. But it is about getting information and getting that information quickly. I also have sympathy for, for marketing people and PR people because it's a very, very different landscape today. In a way, the media has been diluted because you're not only dealing with writers in newspapers, you're dealing with magazine people, Twitters, and people, funny people called bloggers who think they are writers. Um, and we really need to keep the, um, I guess the difference between editorial and advertorial very important, um, the distinction there. Now I'm happy to sort of talk more about that but maybe Nick can add on now if he wants to do a little intro. Oh look, I mean obviously I agree with Jane's point that you know the fundamental thing that must be understood is that each of us you know, who write for a living uh, work for the people who read our work and, and, and that's it. 
So, you know, we're trying to communicate with an audience. And, and I guess the other thing I want to say is a lot of us have different audiences. I mean, I write differently for Men's Style magazine to the way that I would for sort of gourmet traveller wine or, you know, the stuff I'm doing at the moment with News Limited. And I guess that's probably the one sort of keynote, sort of high-minded idea I think, you know, I want to sort of get out as we begin is to actually know your wine writer um, and, and, and know what their work is and know where it goes um, and, and what their audiences are because, I mean, there, there might be opportunities to do something, you know, I might have in you know, a magazine like Men's Style and for that audience that wouldn't work, you know, for a, for a news limited national newspaper audience. So don't think of, you know, wine writers as, you know, a, a bunch of people all doing exactly the same thing. Everyone's actually doing something slightly different um, and getting to know what, you know, each person's sort of, you know, particular field is, what their outlets are, what they're writing about regularly. Um, is really important and a better way of targeting um, what you want to do. I mean, there's stuff that might work for, for Jane that will never work for me and, and vice versa. So why waste your time pitching something to me if it's not going to work for me? You should be pitching it at Jane if it's going to work for her. So it's, it's understanding that I think is crucial. So guys, just um, I think, you know, fantastic. Um, commentary uh, particularly around this issue of no no thy journalist no thy media or thy paper um, but have you got any comments on this whole changing media landscape I mean I'm betting that since you guys first started writing about wine you've probably seen some fairly monstrous changes in the coverage that's dedicated to wine columns in traditional media or the explosion of it in online media um, you know have you got any sort of overarching views or commentary on on some of those changes and is it harder or easier today for wineries to get coverage than it was before? Yeah, it's both easier and harder because um, if you're thinking that journal wine writers only write in newspapers and magazines, that is certainly not the case as it was when I first started. Um, I am a journalist by training. Um, what does that mean? Well, I understand I guess the rigours of the change that can come about, you have to move with it. But I also see that as a positive thing because even though I love writing profiles and features, they're generally what I do in terms of that kind of wine writing. Leave tasting notes aside for a minute, I'll come back to that. Um, but fundamentally, it's still the same whether I write online, whether I write for a magazine, I'm still wanting the same thing. And really, public PR means public relations. It's about dealing with someone. One thing that really does piss me off that comes around to, at the moment, and I understand why this happens, because everyone's so busy, aren't they, is the hi there email. If, um, if you can't be bothered to know my name in an email, please don't, just don't bother. Um, I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to save time. I understand that. I don't have a lot of time either. So if I have to then reply to all those hi there emails, um, you know, I won't have time to write because writing is a pretty solitary exercise and you've just got to sit down and do it. Um, so really, if you're in PR, you, you, know, you, know, how, you know how it works. You, you pick up the phone. Remember that? Remember that device? <laughs> no, it's actually a really good device. I don't mind getting the email saying, look, you know, this is happening, are you interested? And I appreciate that people do take the time doing that. But if there's something you think, gosh, I wonder if Jane or Nick would like this, just ring us up. It's a great way of doing it. Um, yes, sometimes I don't get back to people straight away as I once used to because that just shows you how many, um, I guess, the, the, uh, the pressure that's on us in terms of, of getting work out. So, so, Jane, sorry to cut you off, but fine. would you say over the last few years, has the number of phone calls that you received from wine brands pitching your stories, has it gone up or gone down? Down, it's because it's email based um, more so, yep. Yeah, I'm, I agree with that. And how many times do you reckon you convert a story from an email versus a story from a phone call? Oh, look, an email, um, if you're saying an email, well, look, it depends. I suppose I'm just trying to say, you know, like the phone is still the most effective way to have Absolutely. a conversation, right? Absolutely, yeah. And look, look for example, if, if um, 
this, and this is, and I'm, no, I'm not going to use names, but I'll oh. use real examples. No, no, that's, <laughs> no, I'm only really guilty here. Um, but a winemaker left a particular uh, winery, and I wanted to not necessarily know why, because you know it happens all the time. But I was trying to find out who the new winemaker was. Um, I rang, the person didn't get back to me, so I sent an email, a follow-up, and in the end I thought, you know, boy, this, that was like four days ago. No, it wasn't urgent news, but I needed a response, and I finally got one when the owner of the winery uh, accidentally emailed me into a response to uh, someone she was doing PR for them and said, oh, that Jane Faulkner's snooping around. Now, well... You know, I'm a journalist, I perhaps I do snoop around. But you know what? I was just trying to find out who the new winemaker was. It needed a quick call or an email saying, we haven't appointed someone yet, uh, but we'll get back to you. It's not that hard. Um, again, you know, pick up the phone, please. Call me. Um, <laughs> anyway. Nick, just before we move off this topic, have you got anything to add in terms of that whole, uh, you know, the fragmentation of it all. Yeah, look, I do. I maybe I'm a bit old school, and maybe I'm a bit old fashioned, but you know, I do believe in the power of print, and I do believe in the quality of the wine writing in Australian print. Um, and it's it's it is it's really good. I mean, it's what I grew up reading. It's what sort of got me interested was reading Hewan and. And you know, and Ralph and, and James Halliday and you know Mark Shield and Philip White and I, I still think that that the the um I guess the credibility that comes through praise in print shouldn't be undervalued. The thing is, if you think about it, and we're probably going to go on and do some blogger bashing later, and I don't really want to do too much of that, but I think it's always important. It's, a, it's important to remember that you know anything that we've come up with that makes it into print has actually gone through sort of several sets of eyes and 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 been approved through several stages. So there is, you know, and there's not just the, you know, the individual journalist authority behind that, but the authority of the entire publication. And I think that's important. And I, and I also think that you know I think. I'll probably be one of the last to do it because I'm lazy. But you know, even you know, even Hewan's gone online to do to do stuff now. So I think even those of us that have started in old media will all eventually be pushed into new media as well because we need to be in that space. So um, <clears throat> I see opportunities um, for both. Yeah, no. and, and if you still if you still look at it, you still look at the impact of what happens when Tony Love publishes the, you know, his top 100, or when Halliday's thing comes out in the Oz. I mean, those things still, you know, they they they, they still move boxes, make things happen. <coughs> sure, I guess the thing that concerns me with um, newspapers, and I know you said that you know that the story will go oh. through several sets of eyes. Well, I can tell you now they don't these days because um, traditional media, i.e. newspapers, are being so diluted, um, there's you know, hardly anyone there. So the fact you can actually speak to an editor at a newspaper is quite extraordinary these days. Um, and it's a shame. And I am mainly talking about Fairfax because I think um, their coverage on the whole of food and wine is um, appalling. Uh, everything's reduced to a top five or the five best or the three this, and it really it it, I, it delimits the importance of what I think wine writing should be about. Um, not that you want to have a three thousand word essay in a newspaper, but um, there's room for all. So I embrace this um, change in media, the lands that landscape where there's opportunity to write online. I am in the process of putting a website on. Okay, it's taken me a long time, <laughs> but I am getting there. Um, and I'm enjoying that because, you know, you can really write unencumbered. But the difference is by having trained and, I guess, having experience now, um, I am never the most important part of a story. I'm the conduit for that story, no matter what medium I'm working in. So if I'm doing an interview with the winemaker, it's the winemaker that's important. I'm just telling the story. But, you know, I will ask questions. And, for example, there was a new producer that came to town the other day from interstate and um, doing some interesting stuff and selling his wine for $200 a bottle. 
So for me, I'm going to say why, um, you know, to get that explanation rather than being spoon-fed something and not asking the questions. Why is the best word for a journalist to use? Um, so whenever I'm, a PR is sent to me, a press release is sent to me, I'll often, um, uh, you know, why am I being sent this? Is it, is it interesting? And if I don't get that immediately, I'm just going to delete it. Um, yeah, and I think to, um, to think that whole the comment that you made before about the opening introduction to the email, which is hi there, um, I suppose I want to bring this around to this issue of an exclusive story. Is is the hi there hiding up the fact that that's the same email that they've just pumped out to their however many writers are on their one A list or something sure. like that? And exactly, but you know, an exclusive. I think that's really hilarious um, when you're talking about wine. What? Name me. Uh, I can't remember a wine story that was exclusive. What you know? If I found out that a, a producer was doing something toward or um, illegal, you know, that might be an interesting. You know, you think, gosh, I'd like to scoop on that. But an exclusive. What? When when they say, oh, my new vintage of Cabernet Sauvignon is being released on Friday. Yeah. Wow. You, you and the other 3,000 are trying to get that as well. But it's, you know, an exclusive really, it, in this day and age, it has to be darn good to be offering it to a certain person. I'm not against that, um, but really. We're not talking, we're not talking hard hitting news most days. No, we're not. On the wine, on the wine front, are no. we? Um, but uh, I, I do think it's interesting that we have found a way of including, including the Packer Wacker uh, headline, which is still, I think, one of my favourite headlines written uh, into a wine a webinar about wine media. Um, Mick Dowling, I'm interested that you didn't make a comment. Um, so what do you guys want? What's important in communicating? All right, you've got, I can see you've got about the RRP. So let's just talk about tasting notes. They're tasting notes, they're not really a story. Let's be very clear on that. Um, for me, a story is about newsworthiness, whatever that means for you. Um, so if, uh, like the other day, a lovely producer contacted me saying, oh, we've just won this trophy and we're so proud and we want everyone to know and we think it's a great story, but it isn't. It really isn't a story. Um, I've got, so I said, why? Well, look, because we you know we won this trophy and it's sometimes hard when they put their heart and soul into a wine that wins at a local show. I get that. It's good for the, the, the local media and the, you know, having the local press on board, great. But in terms of its newsworthiness beyond that, it's the context that perhaps isn't. So jumping from that back to tasting notes, tasting notes are just that. Um, look, I love, I love tasting drinking wine, I love writing about it. I think every wine writer, that's why we do it. Because um, you'd be bonkers otherwise, because certainly not for the money. Um, so in terms of um, tasting notes, I actually cannot believe that in 2014, I'm still being sent wine with no RRP on it. On, and all it needs to be is on a little, even a handwritten note or a sticker on the back when um, it's to be released or the date it was sent and perhaps um, the other most important factor there is the contact details, preferably for the winemaker. Um, that's it. I don't need a tasting note sent to me because that's my job. Um, I am interested sometimes in the technical stuff but then I can ring uh, the winemaker if that information is not ready. Certainly the larger um, Wineries do have that information and good on them for having that, but for the smaller ones, it's just a good thing to, to sort of consider. Rhino? Yeah, look, I mean, those, those, those things are key. If you, I mean, when you just, if it is you know, a churning out of tasting notes operation, and um, certainly I've learnt a lot more about that in the last couple of weeks. I'm filling in for Tony Love while he's on. Um, long service leave and so that is a lot of you know tasting and writing the tasting notes to be spread around you know, the news limited papers around the country so I've done more chasing bottle shops and recommended retail prices in the last couple of weeks than I ever have you know normally with a lot of the features based stuff I've been doing you know there's time to, to get everything I need um, but when you're churning out, you know, a lot of tasting notes a day for deadlines, those sorts of things, you know, are crucial. 
have it on the release, have it on the bottle, assume that you know, the person who's sitting there doing it is probably lost the press release you know, in the enormous friggin' pile of cardboard that's built up in their office and isn't going to try and go through that again to find the press release. So having it on the bottle, I think, is always the best place for it. Um, and um, also, I just think, I have found the last couple of weeks, websites that have downloadable bottle images are incredibly useful. Um, I'm not having, you know, particularly when you're a deadline dickhead like me and I'm invariably doing it right up against a deadline, sort of sitting around waiting for someone to get back to me on that is a pain in the ass. But if I can just go to the website, download it, forward it on to the editor, life is so much easier. Uh, Jen here has just sort of asked me, you know, written a little note, when it comes to feature writing, what are the things I'm looking for? Well, I mean, that, that, there's no set, um, I don't, I get meat on the bones of a story, really. I tend to try and find my own angles. Some of the stories I'm sort of happiest with have come off my own back rather than, um, and, and it's, it's through exposure to the people involved and, and, and the wines involved. I mean, I did a story years ago, I remember being particularly proud of, basically of all the winemakers that had gone through working at Rockford under Robert O'Callaghan. Um, and so I sort of rang Robert and got in touch with him and we fleshed out that story and the people I could go and speak to. I spent four days in the Barossa going around talking to you know, all these people and another couple of days on the phone talking to people who'd gone further and wider. So always, I guess in terms of trying to sort of attract a feature writer, try and think of what is worth a thousand words or two thousand words in what you're doing and it's, you know, always, always think of that. What would you want to read about your particular operation if, some, you, know, if you, know, you had the space to have two thousand words? A interesting angles. Something someone hasn't seen before is always, always good. I mean, another example, just from my own stuff, is something we did with the Alumbra a couple of years ago. Mainly because I wanted to taste a vertical of the Alumbra signature, and so how, how could I manufacture that? We decided to do a story on. <laughs> oh, you're good. Yeah, oh, that's a taste I wanted to do. So, well, how do we do that? And so, we arranged to get all the. Um, the, the living signatories of that wine, you know, and the story behind the Alumba signature that each each release carries the signature of someone who's had significant involvement with the Alumba. Um, so we got all those people together for a story, and you know, and a dinner at Alumba. So you know, some fantastic shot, you know, photographs come from that. You get great stories because everyone's sitting around, and and over the course of the evening, gets progressively more pissed. Um, you get some fantastic stories, you know, I've got stuff outside smoking with Peter Lehman and, and Macca and, and those sorts of things, you know, giving, the, giving a journalist an opportunity to be embedded in something like that makes a better story. There you go, I've been rambling. Yeah, no, no, I agree with that. I think it's, um, uh, I guess writers like us, we, you know, I will go out to the winery. Of course, you know, you can't go everywhere, but it is about meeting those people and finding out the stories, you know, what makes them tick. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, you know, there are a lot of great people out there, but not everything is newsworthy or not everything is of interest that day. But sometimes it'll be one thing that someone says as you're leaving, you think, that's, that's, that's what I've been looking for. It's the, it's the link. It's the linchpin to the story. Or I'll remember that for next time. So nothing's ever wasted. Um, sometimes, you know, you go along to events and uh, um, there's this expectation, oh, you'll get a story out of this. And uh, I think half the time we get, well, not half, sometimes we're, we're invited to events because it's like uh, you'll write it up. Now, I actually don't have time to go to events, um, but if I think there's something there, like the producer, I think, oh, I've been meaning to catch up with that um, winemaker. Um, and then you never know what you're going to get because there are different areas where you'll get that information. It's not just a one-on-one. -on -one. 
Um, you might be somewhere and it's that one thing they say and then all of a sudden in my head, because I've got stories in my head, it's, you know, they drive me crazy. They're always there. There's always something to write about. So you just don't know when you're going to get it or that maybe Angie says something and I think, oh, that's a good idea. I didn't think of that. So, you know, it is about that. Yeah, indeed, indeed. <laughs> that relationship that goes on. And I think that's a really good thing and a positive thing. But as a trained journalist, I know, you know, I know about stories. It's, it's the, I mean, that's why I am a writer because I'm mental with it. It's like I'm thinking them up all the time. So, for example, and it could be a simple thing. It doesn't have to be three thousand words. Remember those days when you could write three thousand words? Now everything's a shopping list. Paid for every yeah, one of them. Indeed, indeed. I mean, but there are different avenues now. You know, there are some really great magazines you can write for that offer those long fo um, format um, stories, which is great. But it's about mixing it up, I guess. Um, but just about the new angle. You know what? Nothing really is ever new, isn't it? Is it? It's like. Um, but it's trying to find something that might be a bit different. And you must always assume that the reader has never read that before. So sometimes I think, oh, gee, I'm repeating myself. But you sort of have to in a way. So um, like an example where Mount Mary, they never seek publicity whatsoever. Um, however, Sam Middleton is the young winemaker who's taken over. Um, and he's just done his first vintage where it was his very own and obviously there's a lot of pride in that which is the 2012 vintage and I actually think that is a story so I have done one on that yeah. and but it's not just you know wow this vintage it's about the fact that his grandfather started this amazing uh, winery the history behind it and then sort of linking that all together uh, and turning it into something um, so I'm looking for stories everywhere I don't mind where they come from Guys, there's been um, one comment through our comment box from Charlie um, asking about things like journalist alerts, uh, things like maybe sauce bottle or uh, food for media in this instance that Charlie's referring to where, you know, the journo puts a call out for a story or a lead or something like that. Is that something that either of you, or have you ever used those sorts of services? Never. No, and I'm not sure I would. I think, no, I think... Yeah, the, the story idea is going to come from inside my head and then I'll find the ways to go and flesh that out. Yep. That's um, just me. Charlie, I'll provide you with a, a recent example from our business. Uh, it's not, um, it was wine industry related and it was a source bottle call out and uh, honestly, how long have we been receiving source bottle call outs? Like what, three, four times a day, four years and every now and again we say, oh yeah, we'll put something up for that once. One time has that you know effort of responding to that call out through Source Bottle, and this is from a PR you know company perspective of putting one of our clients up actually resulted in that client being involved in a story recently. So um, you know yes, I think those sorts of things are really interesting. I think you can spend a massive amount of time um, trying to you know stay on top of all those call outs. Um, and, and maybe not really, a bit like competition entries, yeah, I'm sure the more you enter, the more greater your chances of winning, but from our experience at Dig and Fish, uh, it's taken an incredibly long, long time to get that to convert to anything. Um, just a really quick mention on general media, I mean, Jane, from a journalist perspective, do you, just the difference between a wine column and a general news story, for instance, is there anything else people need to be really careful of? Yeah, well, it's not being careful. It's just, I guess, uh, being aware of what the journalists, uh, who they write for. Um, if you're writing for a daily, uh, which is very rare these days, but occasionally, um, and this also annoys me, the fact that I don't think newspapers cover wine very well in the daily newspaper, you occasionally get um, a story done when, you know, uh, when Grange, you know, is selling at $799 on release, and two paragraphs, the newspaper, um, but yeah, or, or you get the little feature where they'll get three people off the street to try the new grains, and then they'll try something that sells for twenty-five bucks, and make sure they find three people who like that more than the grains. That's the standard old chestnut that gets rolled out most years. Yep, yep. I love the box pop, but um, <laughs> you know that we do live by deadlines. But if if I think something is urgent because I'm writing, you know, uh, if, if I'm writing a piece that's for a newspaper and it's for tomorrow, I'll certainly tell the the person I'm speaking to. 
um, look, I need to speak to so and so. It's for it's for tomorrow, so I need to speak to them in the next hour or so. Yeah. I mean, obviously, the magazines there's a longer lead way. Um, if I'm wanting a photograph, um, Ryan Ryan mentioned earlier that bottle shops. You know, for me, then I don't need them today, but you know, within a week it'd be good. Um, and sometimes, you know. <laughs> because we're all so busy, people forget things, and I do too, but um, just sort of be aware that we need you to be available, I guess, that's the thing. Um, yeah. That Too many occasions latterly where I have um, either spoken or emailed PR people uh, and, and haven't got a response until two or three days later. Now, thankfully, I wasn't writing for, I mean, because I would be getting on the phone saying I really need someone to get back to me. But that's sort of not good. Just a, a quick email, say, got your email, we'll get back to you soon. That's all I need to know. Um, it's so that, you know, when I work from home, because um, that's my office at the moment, um, I'm not alone thinking, no one loves me. They're not responding. Because if I don't get it, if, if, if I'm not getting that information back, and it'll be some basic stuff, then I'll just go on to something else. So, and that happens. So go back to the point of and talk about, you know, what are the things that people do that you just want to say, please? Yeah, can I just quickly, just before we move on to that, just a couple of things on general um, news media, only because, like I said, in the last couple of weeks with my Tony Love hat on, so Tony will be doing, you know, if there is going to be a general news story in the News Limited paper, Tony will be doing it. So, and I'm on call to be doing that, but in the three weeks I've been covering him, there hasn't been you know, anything. There was one thing with an awards show where they rang me and I said, look, ring the news desk because it's not up to me to pitch that story. So if the news desk want, wants the story, they will ring, you know, in the news of the case, Tony, or for the next few weeks, me, and say there's a story in this, go and do it. But it's not really going to come from the wine writer to the news desk. The news desk will pick up on something and we'll, we'll ask the wine writer to do it. I think Tony is the only tame wine writer on a newspaper staff anymore, so you know, that's worth mentioning. I mean, obviously business stories, the stuff that you know, the Blair Speedies of this world will do is a whole separate discussion and, and something that you know one day we should probably get him to discuss as well. But that's at a, you know, that's at a takeover of Treasury sort of level that doesn't really interest us today, I would have thought. Okay, so um, what are the don't do? Look, I don't want to be so prescriptive because as soon as you tell someone, oh, don't do that, then you get nothing or, you know, people say, oh, we're not send Jane any of that stuff that she's... She's a cranky person. Yeah, she's so cranky. It's not about that, but you just... Look, I and again, I have sympathy, but it's about newsworthiness. Now, you've really got to think about what that word means because... I don't need to get an email saying it's great, the Halliday Wine Guide is out and again, every winery who does well, you know, feel proud about that. But that maybe put the information up on your website. I don't need an email or with a press release saying that you just got a score of 96. Um, I don't, and in fact, I don't know why that happens in the first place. Why is that being sent out to other writers? Um, it's a weird thing. Um, and, and I sort of was thinking about that and in a way I think scoring has really diluted wine writing to an extent. Um, it's a shame that everything is about that. Not just wine writing, I guess we go to films, we go to, and we read restaurant reviews, and everything's about a score as if the, you know, the words don't matter. But I can tell you that for me, words matter much more than a score, but it's, um, you know, it's a bit of a, a catch-22 there. Um, I would hope that uh, you know, people do look beyond the scores and do read the words because um, you know, it's far more interesting to know that it, perhaps a wine is you know, beautifully poised, comes from an amazing vineyard and attention to detail, then it, then it gets 95 or 6. I guess that's the selling point for some producers, um, which is well and good. But um, that's just, just a byproduct. Just on that scoring point, guys. Uh, you know, looking at the um, you know almost wholesale move, I suppose, to scoring out of 100. I mean, do, do consumers? Um, this is supposition, I suppose. But do people really know what the hell is the difference between 96 and 97, or you know, 96 and 98? I mean, I, I in my scanning of the wine scoring 
world, it seems like it's all got really skinny. Like there's this skinny and sk skinnier and skinnier band of scores that are actually getting published. I mean, you never see, you know, you very rarely see something below nine, you know, in in the eighties or the low eighties. Oh yeah, um, if you're if you're drinking eighty nine point one, you may well die. <laughs> well, then, well, then why don't we just score them out of ten? Done with it then. There is, yeah, there's this scoring arms race where I just think everyone's fingers stuck on the nine button. Yes, I would agree. I don't agree. know. I mean, I, 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 I don't score wines in print, um, so I've never got too hung up on it. But I, yeah, look, I, I think they are, a, yeah, people would like to think they are a service for the readers. I think ultimately they're a service for the retailers. Interesting point. Yeah, I, don't, I think, I mean, and, and I know like, just having been on wine show committees and the discussion about moving from 20 points to 100 points and all that sort of stuff, and the discussion is always about, you know, maybe the consumer's got a better idea of what 100 points means rather than the odd 20 points, and that's probably valid, but who's driving that? The retailers are. So, um, and I just think that they're the ones most closely watching, you know, the scores that appear at the end of um, people's words. Yes, and then uh, having them hoisted up on their website for seven seconds later. Um, what about that? your view on that? I know, Nick, you say you don't score in print, but um, what is your view about wineries or retailers or whoever it may be using your quote or a snippet of your quote uh, using your reviews and scores, and, you know, that landscape seems to have changed quite significantly in recent years as well. Yes, well it was one of the points I wanted to make about copyright because um, it is breach of copyright. Unless you get permission from the writer to use your, your tasting notes or any word, it's a breach of copyright, it's illegal. It's basically stealing um, our work. And so, look, there's a bit of a thorny issue with that because um, uh, there are some people who you'd say, yes, just, you know, sure, use it. I mean, some people don't even ask and they use it anyway. But it's a dilemma that I'm having at the moment with an online um, capacity where I'm going to have many, many more tasting notes than I could ever dream of putting in a newspaper where you're limited. So all those notes are going up. But um, I'm now trying to work out because there has to be a subscription site. There'll be some free content and the subscription site. It is mainly for readers, for punters. I want them to, to get involved. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, you know, there has to be a fair price for them, but then knowing that then your work is going to be used as part of a company's strategy of PR or marketing, which is, it happens, you, you just have to accept it. And so there is a dilemma about that. But the bottom line is, it is copyright. You know, they're my words. It, I've done the work. And, you know, there'll be certainly plenty of producers that think, oh, we don't like what she says. She knows, you know, don't like her. That, and that's okay. You don't have to read my stuff. Um, but you know, for people who are out there think we really like the way that person writes, you know, then then I think you just you do have to pay for those words. It's as simple as that. But you know, the diversity in writing, um, the different writers. You've only got two of us. We have to got a similar bent in terms of the way we approach um, a story. But um, you know, there are lots of different writers out there, and I think that's a really good thing. And you know, younger people coming up. My concern, I guess, it, I'm sort of jumping here a little bit, but is um, and it's not just bloggers, by the way, because there's some really good bloggers out there. But um, some people have no idea how to write. They think it is perfectly okay to accept money for their words, and it isn't. And so for those people, if there are winery folk out there listening to this, don't, that you should not be paying those people to, to write tasting notes so that it's just wrong. It's morally wrong. Maybe not legally wrong, but morally wrong. So I've never been paid by a wine company and that's not going to happen. So I can at least say that people who read my stuff know that um, there's that an independence, I guess. There's no one telling me what to write. There's no one telling me what I should be drinking and writing about. Um, and you, know, you take it for, that, well, we like her at work or we, we don't. Nick, do you have anything to add on that? Uh, look, I, I, some... Yeah, like again, because I, I, I've never been much of a churner of tasting notes and more features, 
hasn't been something that I've had to worry about too much. But I, I know, you know, people like, you know, and Campbell and Gary were first sort of kicking wine front off um, and, you know, a lot of that stuff was being sort of just ripped off willingly to be used in, you know, various marketing purposes. Again, more by retailers, I think, than, than, than wineries. Look, I, I don't have, you know, a huge problem with, you know, a winery wanting to use something that I may have have said in an article or, you know, or something as part of their marketing collateral. I guess that's fine. My my fear is that if it gets to the point where you're getting paid, you know, if Woolworths or Coles wanted to, had to pay to use your scores and notes each time, what's that going to do to your scores? Is the wine going to get 97 because you know then that Woolworths or Coles will pick it up and pay for it? Or is it going to get the 89 that it deserves and you, know, you don't get paid for it? So, I mean, that's a bit of a slippery slope thing that you know, I don't think is happening, but I could see happening and I'd hate to see happening. Yeah, sure, that, that is a concern. Um, I guess the thing is, you know, again, for me, I'm writing for the readers out there, so there's no point saying a wine's 94 because you're going to be paid for it when really ultimately it's a wine. And, you know, gosh, there's nothing wrong with wines in the 80s. We nearly, really need to recalibrate a little bit here. I think people are getting a bit um, skewed with some of this. But that could also be a byproduct, you know, maybe we're looking at better wine, who knows. But, um, Scores seem to be, you know, pushing upwards. But look, I mean, I need to go to bed at every night and I can lie straight, I guess. So there'll be wines that I've criticised because, you know, maybe it's a vintage thing, maybe it's just not up to scratch, whatever. Um, and you've got to accept, accept that, I'm afraid. And if a, a, a producer doesn't like that, well, you know, I'm sorry. Um, but that's the way it is. The, that, the wine you're looking at on that day, if it's, if it's 85, if it's 80, uh, if it's 95, you give it the score that's what it is today. It's a snapshot. I mean, this is the problem there in of tasty notes anyway, um, which, you know, uh, and it's true that retailers take, you know, great joy in using because it saves them time. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's a dilemma. So, Yes, it is a challenge. And we've got some commentary here, Jane, uh, from Natalie Pizzini saying, is it okay to use writer's words in quotes with the source credited? Or is that still a breach of copyright? No, look, if, if someone, um, look, that is okay. Um, if, um, if, you do, if you were saying that, uh, for example, you know, Jane Faulkner said the Pizzini Nebbiolo Coronamento 2005 is, you know, the best one to date or something like that. A snapshot like that, a quote, is absolutely fine. Would you um, still prefer the winery to just extend you the courtesy of mentioning it or would, would that just inundate your inbox? Look, probably inundate my inbox and I wouldn't, I'm really not going to worry about a line, I can tell you, but um, I did follow up when I found out that a, um, a distribution company, an importer, um, took entire stories of mine when I used to write for The Age, the entire story, used it in their marketing stuff and then e even misspelled my name. <laughs> so I thought, oh gosh, at least get that bit right. But no, it's like you can use a bit, of, you know, what what is... Uh, regarded as a reasonable amount, I guess you could use. But if you're using it, uh, tasting notes and the whole lot to drive your media campaign, that's absolutely not on. Um, and I just think there's just been a bit of an ignorance about what can be used. If in doubt, uh, contact the writer, please. It's, it's really that simple. Yep. Um, Guy, there's a few tips up on the slides here at the moment, and I just wanted to make a uh, special mention to the scooping. Um, comment. That, that, comes, that comes from down on high, doesn't it? That's a pronouncement from high on the Halliday Hill. It is a, it is a pronouncement high on the Halliday Hill. Uh, you guys would know that uh, James remains patron of WCA and um, he always uh, gets the communication and, and reads it and comments. He's a very active member of our WCA community and uh, his two things were um, how do you spell Sauvignon? It is not S-A-V, so please stop abbreviating something to cab stab. And his other issue was that scooping is reserved for dog shit in the park uh, <laughs> as opposed to awards or other, other great mentions. But I think that that caution with language and not, um, you know, making something that's factual and is readable sure. is better than being over the top and a bit, yeah, readable. Well, yeah. And I guess remember that you're dealing with people who are by their nature pedants. 
Yes, you know? absolutely. <laughs> no, you know, and, and James is, is, is you know, one of the best of them, you know, he will pick up any sort of little um, failing like that. So, you know, it is, when, you, when you're trying to communicate with people whose world is words, it's wise to make sure those words are as polished as they possibly can be. Or, or at least just open and honest. And to go to the other ex extreme, something that seems like someone writing what they think a press release should sound like is the most ineffective kind of press release. Either have it polished and beautiful or raw and simple and honest, but the, that's the in-between um, that you know just gets pretty quickly binned. And not too long, let's get... Oh, yeah, absolutely. Look, uh, again, um, look, it comes back to that newsworthiness. Um, I would say that 85% of press releases, which is the irony, uh, are not newsworthy. Um, I know your latest releases, that's important to me. I need to know that your wines uh, are coming out, um, and that's great. It doesn't need a press release. Um, it does need perhaps work from the marketing person or the PR person to put a note in or um, because I'm an environmentalist, I'm trying to keep down the paper uh, trail there. I don't mind the email to say, we've just sent you the wines, RRPs will be attached on the back of the bottle and the tech notes are here on your email. Fantastic. That's all I need. And I know then to follow up with so-and-so. And because, -so. you know, perhaps I know that marketing person, I'll just say thanks. Now, you know, it might be a quick thanks, but at least they know I got that message and on, on I go. Because um, I know that, and there's some questions coming about about smaller producers, what to do. Um, that's all you have to do. Your name, um, even a, you know. Sometimes I love the little handwritten note. Hi Jane, current releases here today. Um, we'll talk to you soon. Now the thing is, when enough um, you often ask and love to know your feedback. The feedback, you know what? That's consultancy. That's really not about wine writing. Um, Except when it does get into print or it does, you know, get online. So we're not consultants, and uh, we'll get eventually get around to the wine. And I do try and taste every single bottle sent to me. And can I tell you, that's a lot. So, yeah. um, but you know, it's part of it. That's part of my job, and I do enjoy that most of the time. It's, uh, except when there's no RRP on the back label, there's no one to contact, and I don't know when the wine's sent out. The other thing is, please don't send your wine out to me if it's um, not due for release for eight months, because my home is not a warehouse for your, <laughs> your goods and chattels, because it looks like a warehouse sometimes. Um, so just be mindful of that, that um, you know, you think, oh, we'll just send them this, um, multiply that by the other. Because I really like a home. review when my wine's released, so I might... Yeah, and it's, it's never a bad idea just to flick off the email to say, look, they're on their way keep an eye out for them. It does actually, it does work, at least puts it in your head. When you're going to the, the post office and, and picking up 15, 20, 25 boxes, but you know, you will see the one that you got the email a couple of days earlier to say this is what's coming. I know there's been a few people, and not everyone can do it, but um, you know, have stickers that go on the outside of a box saying this is what's in this box because I, mean, it, I don't want to sound facetious or you know anything like that but it's a, it is a pain in the ass unpacking all this stuff constantly. I mean look there's worse problems in the world to have but it, it, it does take a lot of time um, and if you can start, if you can actually see what's in that pile of cardboard you can yeah, you can work out your plan to, of attacking that and you know well, there's something in that box that I can use straight away so I'll unpack that now and get into that but some of this other stuff can wait for a little bit. So it, it is quite useful to have because you know you can imagine it's a, it's a pile of those red and white Australian post boxes which I friggin hate but you know so it's it's quite anonymous, but if you can make something on there that marks out what yours is, whether it's a label just stuck on that box or printed stickers, I know Tullet used to do it quite well, had you know, little bottle shots of what was lined up in that box, just so you know what's in there and you can actually make a plan of attack for unpacking it all, that's useful. Um, guys, I was just going to make a comment about this whole issue about uh, don't do a beat up and using real facts and figures because 
Uh, as somebody who has been running a wine PR business for 14 years, actually slightly more, but I'm going to stop counting. Um, I've often been asked by a winemaker or winery owner to stretch the facts um, and to be, uh, you know, because oh, you're in spin, aren't you? You're a spin doctor. That's what you do. And it's absolute bullshit. The only information that's worth sending out is accurate information that is authentic, is reliable and can be substantiated by the producer. So um, you really are on a hiding to nothing from both a reputational perspective um, and a business perspective if you do want to try and stretch the facts and uh, any good PR person worth their, worth their salt will push back on you pretty hard and say, no, I'm sorry, I'm not sending that out because it's just not true. And any PR person worth their salt should also be prepared to push back and say, I'm sorry I'm not sending that out because that's not a story. If you're paying people for advice from a PR perspective and their advice is there's no story in that or Jane's going to shoot me if I send her that or I'm going to get one of those emails from here and that says, Angie, I really expected better because let me tell you it happens when we get asked to send out rubbish. Um, you should respect the advice that you're paying for. Um, but, yeah. Uh, I just yeah, and I guess it's a, the, the, a lot of times the people I feel sorry for you know, is the new marketing coordinator in a, in a winery that's never had one before, that kind of thing. And then so suddenly there they are trying to impress and, and you know, the boss comes in and says, you know, we're bottling something tomorrow, write a press release about that. And that person is not often in a position to say, well, that's a load of shit. No, why would we want to do that? So, I guess maybe for those marketing, you know, those sorts of people trying to communicate to their to their bosses what you know what reasonable expectations are. I mean, it's a huge challenge, but but very worthwhile. But you see a lot of you see a lot of press releases come through, and you think, I feel sorry for that person because you can tell that. They don't necessarily see the story in it, but there's someone who's been pushing, saying, that's what you're here to do, get something out. Every new marketing coordinator or marketing employee, the first thing should be to sign them up with a membership to WCA so they can download this webinar out of our archive of um, incredibly yeah. valuable new marketing person world and show it to their boss and say, look, that's I'm not going to do that. And be brave, all right? Sometimes you have to say, no, that's not a story. and. Um, you know, when when I was full time in um, in at the Age and elsewhere um, in newspapers, I should say, you know, sometimes you, you know I had to tell my chief of staff, and can you imagine this? Well, that's not a story. It's now that's harder. I can tell you because they say, well, how come so and so is you know doing something? I said, that's okay. I've investigated that. I've rung that person and had a chat to them, and it's not true, and it's not worth a story either way. Um, maybe that's easier for me because it's, it's the most automatic thing for me to do. I'm going to, I'm going to investigate that. Uh, I'm going to find out about that. So, anyway. Yeah. But, you know, I, I think the key for all of this and, and one of the big things though, is that thing about newsworthiness and really challenge yourself to say, if I opened the paper, would I want to read this story? Yeah. If I opened the magazine, is this a story I would flick over or is it one that I would stop and read? And I think, yep, the controversy around a pin on wire winning the Jimmy Watson, fantastic. Uh, my latest, you know, Sauvignon Blanc picking up double bronze at Cowra, probably not such a great story. Um, the Jimmy Watson trophy win that Pinot Noir had currency around media because it was such a major change and historically what had happened. But I mean, I think the Jimmy Watson is probably the only trophy that still can generate that has a general news currency, yeah. I would say, again, having been our business, we're not doing it this year, but we have for the last four years done the PR for the Jimmy Watson Trophy. It has got harder and harder every year to place that story in the press. So Yeah, and, and, and the thing is it should really be, you know, the old Tucker Seabrook, which is what, what is now the Fine Wine Partners Trophy. I mean, that that's a good example of a, a, a trophy that should have some currency too, because general media can get their head around the idea that that's a bit like a, you know, a grand final trophy, but it never, never gets any traction. No, but it's who you're pitching it to. I mean, really, what, what does, you know, if you're putting that in a newspaper, so what? So it won a, a trophy. Now, don't get, um, no, 
please wind, wind people listening to this, don't be upset, but it's just like it has to have currency with the consumer. Um, all we're doing here is saying, oh, you know, it's between the media and the PR company that's putting out the information. It's got to be for the reader. It has to be of interest. You want to keep reading go, gee, I didn't know that. And yes, I can understand about the Pinot winning and of course the added bonus because another Pinot perhaps should have won it but didn't have quite the numbers. So there was that added story. But you know, every year to write about the Jimmy Watson is not that interesting. No. Uh, you know, let's be honest. Um, it's a proud thing for some producers, I get that, but things are changing. It's not all that important anymore. There are too many wine shows. That's a story for another day. Yes, and can't understand the wine show system. Oh, sorry, now I'm started, opened a bit of a can of worms mentioning the old Jimmy Watson, but anyway. 99.9% of consumers can't understand Mick Dowling. <laughs> oh, come on. Look, I, no, I, on think, I reckon that's a good comment because um, wine consumers, they, it's not that they don't understand. There are so many things out there. <laughs> good call, Mr. Dowling, good call. We expect consumers to be up to date with everything. Now, I think I'm a wine savvy person, actually, but I have be, you know, I go into bottle shops occasionally to see what's out there. It is frightening. There's a lot of there are a lot of bottles on that shelf competing for space. So sometimes I see a little metal and think, oh, maybe that means something. So I agree, it's really difficult. So, um, but again, it's a complex thing where sometimes that's important, sometimes it's not. I don't think the media is going to help anyone saying, you know, check out this label because you know it's got a little gold sticker that means this, this, and this. That's another issue going on there. So anyway, it, it, look, it just I guess the thing is. The media landscape is complex. It is constantly changing. Smaller producers, there was a comment there, how do I, how do I know if my wine has been written up? I know it's hard, but you, you do have to find out. You either have to Google it or have media monitors to check that. Um, and it, and uh, again, there's Nick and myself. There are others who write for, let's say, more mainstream organisations, for magazines. Um, and then there are a lot of the fluff on the side who think, um, all of a sudden, well, I like wine. I think I'll write about it. I drink, you know. I drink. I should actually. God, I could do a blog, couldn't I? Well, all you have to do is open the front of the wine industry directory and see who lists themselves, because that is not a vetted, a vetted list in the wine industry directory as a wine writer. So, um, you know. So I've never to, been in it. Well, that's because you have to pay to list yourself in it. But I tell you what, oh, Nick. <laughs> yeah. Actually, no, wine writers don't have to pay, but I can tell you that, um, look, I actually say to any producer, buy the book anyway once and have a look or share it. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Because uh, you get a general idea who's writing where. The, thing that the problem is that you have food writers in it as well. So I don't know why you have to send wine to food writers. However, um, but look, it's just a starting point. Yeah, look. No, it just keeps going back to I think what I started with is is actually know know your wine writer, know what each person's sort of particular niches are, and you can probably you can save yourself on postage. You can save you know money on sending samples out because there's some samples that you'd probably want to send to to Jane that you don't want to send to me, and, and vice versa. Um, you know. The, the smart people who are doing it, I can see how they're segmenting it. And even in the last couple of weeks, getting my own samples, but picking up Tony's at the advertiser as well, where there is double up, you know, that's fine, but where there is stuff that's sent to him because it um, has more chance of being in the, you know, the taste section of the Herald Sun than it does in my winemakers to watch column in Gourmet Traveller Wine. I mean, that's, that's, smart and sensible and you know, someone could have sent me that one to me and it would have been a waste of time, whereas to Tony it's right into the other slot of what he's doing. I just think that really think about your media list and it's, it's not just one generic list of every wine writer in the country. It should be segmented. It should have you know, groups within it that you, know, you focus on. And I think, um, guys, we, we 
we all knew this was happen would happen. We are um, running out of time, but um, there's been another interesting question about you know a new cooking pan has more editorial currency in Epicure than a new wine release, and I think you know like in some respects that's actually quite true. Um, and so you know what what does wine have to do to make itself a little more relevant, a little more have a bit more social currency with consumers? Do do you guys think that there's an issue around that with this whole you know master chef phenomenon, or that it's just a well, look, we could talk about that all night over several bottles, actually, um, because I, I often think, why is it that food attracts the attention? But when you look at it, it's always the, the, the fashion statements that come in out, you know, MasterChef. Well, you know, that, there's something else to supersede to that, um, or that'll be superseded, I should say. The um, wine is a funny thing. You know, we all, we all we like a drink and we like to occasionally read something. It's just that... Um, I don't think people know quite what to do with it. You know, wine shows have never really worked. The ones that have been around, um, the couple that have been made in Australia haven't been great. I don't know, but I don't think we should get bogged down in that. There are other areas to look other than just the newspaper. The thing that's a bit disappointing with newspapers is, you know, it's the everyday punter that gets the newspaper, which I quite like that factor yeah. about it. It's a great way but we have to look elsewhere. We have to go online. And more and more people are going online to find out their wine information because they might think, oh, I like that, that writer. Where have they gone? Where are they now? So there's more, you know, you're not closed in. So they, well, they only write for that. So there's more of that going on. And <coughs> you might have to buy a magazine, a wine magazine now, but heavens above. You know, um, don't think that a newspaper is the only source of information about wine because they do it fairly poorly on the whole. You've got the Oz, I mean, obviously I'm based in Melbourne, so I'll talk about those, but you have the Oz on a Saturday, which does pretty good yeah. um, coverage, because um, it's a bit leachier, that's why. You know, there's more than just the shopping list. I mean, it's heartbreaking to see wine reduced to a shopping list. However, it's better than nothing, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Um, guys, we really are running out of time, but um, a couple of quick comments about the whole role about social media and Facebook and Twitter and how that interacts, if it does or not, with the media cycle? Um, it's tricky. I mean, I can... Look, any, any social... Any bland or pure marketing sort of stuff on social media doesn't work and it just it rings a bit false. Um, yeah, and you, you just see a lot of obvious stuff so I'm going, oh, look, I've got to engage with social media. Let's put something on, you know. Isn't it a beautiful day to be drinking our 2014 rosé in the sun kind of thing? That's just shit and that's not really interesting. But, you know, use, if you're going to use social media, use it, I think, as, as a snapshot of what's going on yeah, the kind of stuff that you'd send to your friend and think about it that way. I think social media as a marketing tool has to be very, very softly, softly. It's not a hard sell stuff. It is just a chance to interact with your brand, I think. Um, and look, I don't follow a lot of wine producers on you know, social media. I follow a lot of winemakers and things who do who are doing it of, on their own, but a lot of the stuff that is, you know, the brand tweeting, I don't think has a lot of value at all. And the thing is, if you miss a tweet from this morning, you're not going to go back and scroll through all of those um, of the day. It's, you know, it's a very, it's just a quick thing, a snapshot. You might have to repeat it a couple of times. It's just, for me, an add-on. And if I've, if I've just done a tasting and there are a couple of great wines, I might tweet about that. Just leave it at that. Um, you know, I don't take it too seriously, but it's, it's a bit of fun. It's one avenue, but it shouldn't be, you know, a key um, part of a, a strategy, I guess. It's just part of it. I yeah. quite like it. It's fun. It's meant to be a bit of fun. Oh, it's really fun when you get and when you, you know, find yourself stumbling on a good old Twitter stash. <laughs> <laughs> you made a Windsor Dobbin moment. The hashtag, it'd be so much easier for me to follow this conversation. Hashtag Grumpy Windsor. Well, yes, there is a hashtag Grumpy Windsor. 
Yeah. Uh, Mick Downing wants to know if it's copyright infringement if he uses your tweet, Jane. You know, that's interesting, Mick. Um, uh, well, uh, yes, it is. It, it would be copyright. But, um, you know, who's really going to bother about 140 characters? But, boy, they're the best 140 characters you'll ever see. Can we talk about payment? <laughs> like, I'm joking. <laughs> um, guys, I, we really probably do need to think about wrapping up, but um, just any last comments or things that you wanted to, to talk about this afternoon that we haven't gotten to. Nick, is there anything at your end? Oh, look, I think we've, I mean, we've cut, you know, covered sort of most of the stuff. I just think, you know, just if people need to have reasonable expectations of us and I think we need to have reasonable expectations of people at the other end as well. But um, relationships are, are important and um, I, you know, one of, the, one of the great examples I still think was, um, and I know I think Leanne's on here somewhere, but when Steve Weber and Leanne decided to really shake things up in the Yarra, um, they went through a, a, a process of sort of getting people to come to them and sort of sitting down one on one and just just talking about what they were doing. Um, that sort of stuff is incredibly valuable, and not everyone's in a position to do that. But to get to get your head around what was going on there, that sort of that time, that one-on-one -on -one time, um, was hugely important. You could understand what was going on. You could understand why there was you know, that much enthusiasm about the wine. So try, you know, try and build relationships. Don't just throw throw samples and press releases at it at the wall and and expect something to stick because the, the more that you know people can understand what you're doing the more likely they are to find something interesting in what you're doing but you know how, how you do that well that's that's up to you yeah, it's a constant battle I mean but it's uh, well not a battle but it's um, yeah it's about relationships and um, so uh, you know, I will go the extra mile when I think, gosh, that's you know, someone told me about something. I'm going to follow it up. But my main job is always to ask questions, and sometimes those questions um, uh, might be awkward because you know, not every story is a happy story. It's not always a, you know a cheery one. Sometimes there might be news where you know there's there's something, you could, and I can't think of something that's coming to the top of my head um, to to say that look, you know, you need to answer this, um, and you need to not avoid. Um, news that isn't so great, um, but you need to be available to to us, I guess. Yeah. And so, guys, look, um, just uh, starting to see people doing thank yous and, and dropping off, but a couple of um, quick points to wrap up. Um, be thoughtful. You know, I think was a really key message. Is think about what you're doing, think about your story, and um, do the research. Know who you're pitching it to. Put in some effort to get to know the writers, what they are interested in, what they want to write about, and how they want to engage with you, because it will pay off. Um, and most of all, invest in the relationship, and don't forget that uh, wonderful device called the phone um, that we all use for tweeting and Googling and Facebooking, but may have forgotten to use quite so much for phone calls and connecting with people. Um, you know, and I think from wine communicators' point of view, that's exactly you know what we're about is creating topics that connect people with conversations that make a difference to what we're trying to do in our jobs. Um, you know, every day. So thank you very much to Jen Barwick, um, who is our program manager and works incredibly hard uh, to pull together these sessions and run our webinar program, amongst other things. Thank you very much to Nick and Jane for your time, uh, not only this afternoon but also um, the conversations and contribution that we all had together before today. Um, it's an invaluable opportunity to hear directly from you and uh, you know, hopefully you'll get a few more phone calls and a few RRPs and a few more bottle shots, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. No, that'll be good. Okay. Thanks everybody. I did throw out there about uh, replacing Tony Love. I said, oh, holy crap, you're better in the post office and tell them what's coming your way. Um, just quickly, yeah, tell me about it. Next webinar, Tuesday the 2nd of September, um, a very ambitious uh, attempt by WCA to coordinate a webinar on um, three continents. We're going to have a contribution from Direct Wines in the UK, all hosted by our um, fantastic partners, the WSET. We're also China and here in Australia and it's really going to be talking about 
um, do we overcomplicate wine language and um, particularly the globalisation of wine language and making sure we get our messaging and our communication right. Uh, I certainly know that I will be um, dialing in and listening to that conversation following on from today. Uh, and just finally, um, our entries are open for all of the Wine Communicator Awards for this year. Um, so if you think that you're a talented writer, designer, publisher, communicator, uh, educator, trade writer, whatever it might be, um, please get onto the WCA website and uh, look at putting in your entry for the Wine Communicator Awards. That we will have a February party, a few nice wines, a bit of a shindig, and I did actually say shindig, and award night on the 19th of November. So uh, thanks everybody for hanging on the line. Um, make sure that you do send through your questions following this session, and we'll try to do our best um, to provide responses in an upcoming blog. So go and enjoy a glass of fantastic Australian wine. That's it. Go tell good stories. Good stories and great wine. Thanks, guys. Thank you.